Our first guest in this new series uh, is, as indeed it must be, Mark Stein. I say must be because he has long been just one of my favorites, if not, in fact, the favorites, guest on the radio program, which we ran for some 38 years. Mark Stein, hello. Hey, great to be back uh, with you, Milt, and that is an honor when I uh, when I look at the distinguished uh, roster of guests uh, you, you've had in the last uh, several decades, uh, from from Mrs. Thatcher on down. So I'm I'm honored by what you said, although I'm not entirely persuaded it's true. It's too bad that I couldn't get you and Margaret Thatcher together. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, the one thing I did find on the on the few occasions that uh, Mrs. Thatcher and I did get together is that I had a, a, a terrible job keeping up with her when it came to the Scotch, uh, and oh, yes. uh, she she managed to remain incredibly articulate. Uh, amidst all that, until three in the morning, I, I was I was I was less so. So I think she'd have had the edge on me there. Now I will define what we're up to today, if of course you choose to accept it, and I'm going to do it in the Chinese style. We start with the four dismaying D's. Um, those dismaying D's are decay, dishonesty, decline, all of which you seem to specialize in as you look at <laughs> the works and ways of the world around us. And the fourth D, then, is demographic disaster, which you tend to tie to the other earlier Ds of decay, uh, dishonesty, and decline. What I'm really dealing with there and trying to zero in on is that, in fact, you take the view, not unlike that of Edmund Burke, that human society and its institutions are all radically imperfectible. And the conservative task is to somehow, somehow hold things together in the face of impending and inevitable threat. Um, is that, in fact, your basic stance? Though I know you add to it the color of tremendous wit and a kind of ebullience, which I find unaccountable but delightful. Well, I, 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 that is basically where I stand. Uh, one can quibble about uh, how many Ds there are. I don't think you had debt and decadence in there, but uh, they're also part of it too. And and it is it is hard. I mean, uh, I should actually be incredibly pessimistic and incredibly gloomy, but in fact, if you look at the world a certain way, there is a kind of a dark, uh, mordant comedy uh -huh. to it. Uh, the, the the news just the other day that uh, the go the government of Massachusetts is trying to determine whether in fact the Sarnayev brothers purchased the materials with which they blew up the Boston Marathon using food stamp cards oh. uh, is 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 at one level black and depressing, but on the other hand, whoever succeeds us. Uh, and whoever combs through our rubble, whether it's the uh, Chinese or the Russians or the new caliphate or uh, aliens from planet Zongo, they will, they will find things like that incredibly hilarious. If we can't have the first laugh, uh, we might as well, uh, if we can't have the last laugh, we might as well have the first laugh. You have just confirmed yet another hypothesis of Mark. I keep looking for historical analogies to Mark Stein. And in addition to, uh, what I've just said about Jeremiah and you specializing in Jeremiah's of a modern variety, it occurred to me that you are also not only Jeremiah come again, but I don't know how you'll react to this one, Till Eulenspiegel come again. <laughs> Well, that's uh, no. I don't. I don't know about. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm. Uh, I'm in the. He laughed at I, the. I, I'm a. I'm a merry prankster yes. of a of a kind, but I, I'm. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think I don't think I'd quite go, uh, go go all the way with him. Well, I'm glad that you partially reject it because one does remember, of course, that society's ultimate response to Till Eulenspiegel for telling the truth about uh, the decay and disorder uh, and dishonesty of their society, the ultimate response from the uh, those who control things was to kill Till Eulenspiegel. Yeah, that's that's true. Actually, I'd forgot I'd I'd forgotten that's uh, how the poor guy ended up. I mean, one of the one things I do, uh, I, I I I sort of share with him is that I I like the idea of just riffling through. I mean, he was he got around. He was uh, in uh, Belgium and uh, Denmark and Poland and uh, and Italy. So he 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 roamed 
far and wide for his day. Uh, and uh, one one thing I, that that I do share in common with him is this idea of, of of little isolated, disparate things all over the map uh, that all cumulatively go uh, towards a, a sort of uh, a big picture that works as a whole. So uh, in that in that sense, I'm not I'm not un, un, un or I'm not an Eulen Spiegel esque or whatever the word is. <laughs> um- Things are sort of falling into place today in terms of uh, Chinese lists. And another thing I can easily come to, this being, in fact, the day that we're recording, uh, Tuesday, May 14th, uh, we have not only the four Ds, but we have the three scandals. And the third of those scandals popped just this morning, by which, of course, one makes reference to um, the persistence of the Benghazi scandal and then the... uh, the IRS scandal, which we ran into just a few days ago, and now the Department of Justice scandal. Yeah, and they remind me of something. I was down in uh, Australia a few months ago, and an extremely eminent uh, Australian politician, uh, the very top of Australian society, he'd he'd just flown in, and, and we were having tea uh, on one of the last days of my Australian tour, and he'd, he'd just been at uh, Los Angeles Airport. And, and he said to me rather sadly, he said, I don't feel America is quite a first-world country anymore. And uh, by, I, I thought of that line when I read about these, these uh, three scandals, because in their way, they are all, it's all banana republic stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in that, in that it's uh, it, we're no longer dealing in a land of uh, with a land of laws, but we're dealing with a land of caprices and whims, uh, in which uh, in which whether or not you attract the attention of uh, the state commissar is entirely is entirely whimsical. In in this case, we have the IRS. And, and again, this this is this is the sort of thing that uh, would be too cute if you were writing a satirical novel. Uh, but as evidence of uh, on the on the search for uh, uh, as one of their search words to uh, to find uh, as they saw it uh, dangerous dissenting groups, the IRS used the word constitution uh, to identify which of these uh, th- these various groups uh, merited their closer attention. As I said, if you put that in a novel, it would be regarded as too cute. Then then it turns out they're not just. Uh, asking wholly inappropriate questions of, uh, of American taxpayers. What are your attitudes toward uh, the state of Israel? Are any family members of yours planning to run for office? But they're leaking this information to liberal groups that they do approve of, uh, the whatever it's called, pro-politica or whatever. That's Banana Republic stuff. Uh, the, the Justice Department uh, seizing the phone records of journalists. That's Banana Republic stuff. And and Benghazi, uh, and I think this is why it's been, had such a stunning effect in the Middle East, and particularly among the Libyan political class, whatever one makes of them, uh, they're, they're finding, they're looking at the United States government lying to its people as assiduously as any Gaddafi or Assad or Mubarak ever did. So that's... Uh, the, the North African version of Banana Republic stuff too, uh, and I, I, I think I think they're worrying to me because uh, because you can have societies that still have the outward organs of liberty and democracy and and uh, and functioning institutions. Uh, they still have the outward signs of it, but inside they're corroding and decaying into something else. And and these three stories, what's unnerving uh, for me is that um, America is becoming a not quite respectable uh, free society, and that and and that's what this this administration seems very comfortable with. That particularly figures like Eric Holder, but also the Education Department, which now wants speech mandatory speech codes on every American campus. Uh, again, that's Banana Republic stuff too. You've got to be in conformity with the state ideology. It's no, it's no. Again, I, I'm not saying it's uh, where you know Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia, but we're decaying into something that has the outward institutions, uh, but it's no longer quite uh, a respectable uh, free society. Well, uh, there's so much one could respond to in that. Uh, As an old academic and uh, indeed one of the founding members and I guess still a board member 
of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, which is charged with trying to undo the speech codes on the right. university campuses and, in general, it charges itself with the task of policing the policemen, so to speak. Right. Uh, uh, I am rather disheartened and dismayed by uh, the fact that it always regresses back to the attempt to control faculty and students and thought on almost all American campuses, including the elite ones. Indeed, one wonders what's happening on some of those elite campuses. Yale, where I started my academic career rather a long while ago, seems now to be distinguished more than anything else by its yielding to the requirements or claims of some of its undergraduates or maybe some of its uh, younger faculty by having instituted and celebrating every year a great sex week in which people run around <laughs> naked and otherwise talk about uh, pornographic equipment. <laughs> and right, so, right. What, well, 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 well that's, that's interesting. I, I, I think that's actually not irrelevant. It's the, the, no, the, it's not. The, the left uses sexual liberty uh, and the expansion of sexual liberty as the cover for the retreat of every other kind of liberty. Uh, in other words, people say, people understand that if you can get it on with whatever you want, whenever you want, uh, that, 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 that then people are less inclined to kick up a fuss about uh, shrinking of free speech rights, shrinking of religious rights, uh, shrinking of property rights, uh, as, uh, and, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. In other words, the, the, the idea of liberty is simply sexual liberty, uh, which is very well advanced in, in our world now. Uh, that has provided a tremendous cover uh, for a vast state grab on every, in every other sphere of liberty. Is that, in, in essence, inevitable in large, overdeveloped and overindulged and over-profitable uh, democratic or pseudo-democratic institutions, pseudo-democratic uh, uh, nations? I think not merely of ourselves, but I think of uh, your other nation, namely Canada. You've done a good deal about what's gone wrong in Canada in recent years. And again, in the name of cultural pluralism and uh, openness, <laughs> there's been all sorts of crime <laughs> perpetrated, including some crimes against you. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's true. I mean, I think the United States, uh, Canada... Uh, the United Kingdom. I mean, I, I would just leave it with the English-speaking democracies because I think there's a difference in the Western world between the Anglophone world and continental Europe. Uh, continental Europe gave us uh, a lot of great art, uh, the, the greatest art, the greatest music, but it wasn't so successful uh, in transmitting enduring uh, democratic institutions from one generation to the next. Uh, that's why highly civilized societies, uh, such as uh, 19th century Germany, uh, 30 years later, it was the, the, the most mur murderous uh, dictatorship in, in history. But you can, you can, you can uh, point to uh, uh, e e uh, similar problems, though, uh, though less uh, genocidal, uh, in France, in Italy, in basically a lot of the non-English uh, speaking countries. But, but in, in the British Empire and in the United States, we, we have done a reasonably good job of expanding liberty peacefully, of evolving constitutionally over centuries. And we are at a very peculiar pass. Uh, just to go back to the, the sex thing, uh, California uh, recently had the California legislature in Sacramento uh, recently proposed uh, mandating fitted sheets in Californian motels and, uh, and, and hotels. That's to say elasticated sheets in yeah. the name of health and safety because apparently if a maid has to bend down to tuck the sheet in, uh, she can risk putting her back out. That may be true. It may not be true. But I think you, if you run the Flea Pit Motel out on Route 473, <laughs> uh, in a free society, you should have the right to have an unfitted sheet uh, on on that bed. And it's 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 fascinating me. Uh, Pierre Trudeau, longtime Prime Minister of Canada, when uh, homosexuality was decriminalized in Canada, he said the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Uh, the the government of California says the state has no place in the bedroom that the in the bedrooms of the nation unless you're in there consummating your same-sex marriage on an unelasticated sheet in which case they're going to send uh, the uh, the bureau of california sheet regulators to kick the door down and fine you for that and it's and and it's a, it's bizarre to me that we we now 
uh, put up with intrusions, intrusions on our private space that nobody in human history but if uh, we would have put up with before. But if, but if we don't do that intrusion with regard to fitted sheets, one hears a chorus, to be sure, in Spanish of, from uh, chambermaids all over California saying in Spanish, however one does it, oh, my aching back. <laughs> that's 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 right, and somehow it's the state. You know, you, you, know, you can you can you can usually rely on the market to take care of those things. Uh, that if a chambermaid doesn't like uh, working at the lousy motel that has the unfitted sheets, uh, she'll get a job at the Ritz Carlton, where they where the where the beds are higher and more plumped up, and uh, and the sheets are elasticated. Then the the market usually takes care of those things. But we now have every aspect of life regulated. Um, and it's extraordinary, it's extraordinary to me at the time, for example, you mentioned Benghazi. Uh, Benghazi, uh, the, 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 the guy speaks to Hillary Clinton at 8 p.m. in the evening, uh, uh, Washington time, 2 a.m. in the morning in, uh, in Libya, and he tells her the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the facility in Benghazi is being attacked and they don't know where the, uh, they don't know where the ambassador is. Uh, an hour later, the Libyan prime minister calls him up and says, uh, we've, we've found your ambassador, and unfortunately he's dead. This guy, Hicks, is now the head American guy in Libya. He was the number two, but the ambassador is dead. He's now in charge. He calls Washington. It's nine in the evening in Washington. He cannot get the Secretary of State on the phone. <laughs> even as the embassy is under attack, even as the embassy is under attack and, uh, and, and the ambassador is dead, he can't get hold of anyone in government who matters. Government, government does not have the resources to put someone on the phone in Washington to him, uh, to talk to him when uh, when the mob is firing RPGs at American sovereign territory in Libya and the ambassador is dead. And yet government uh, has, uh, has all the resources it needs uh, to send uh, uh, officers around to hassle a seven-year-old girl who's, who's running a lemonade stand without a, a $300 permit. Uh, to uh, to send federal a federal uh, agents, fish and game agents, round with state troopers uh, to threaten a girl who rescued a woodpecker from uh, the jaws of a cat. Government's got all govern government's got time for all of that, but the one time you need it, like the three a.m. call from Benghazi, then there's nobody around to answer. Well, that. I fear, as usual, you're a little bit deficient in understanding the complexity of the situation as one focuses and one should focus upon our relations with the Islamic or the Muslim world uh, because there are niceties and complexities there which have to be not merely noted but <coughs> in some sense indulged. I offer you, and we're about to pause in just a moment, but I look forward to your response. I offer you a very telltale quotation which really defines the challenge and the great opportunity of this present moment uh, between East and uh, between the West and the Near East, at least, uh, namely this quote: "America and Islam are not exclusive and need not be in competition. Instead, they overlap, and they share common principles of justice and progress, of tolerance and the dignity of all human beings." You recognize that quotation? Uh, no, I don't actually. Who said that? I've uh, heard a lot of things like a it. rather prominent American. His name is Barack Obama. And oh. I look forward to your response right after we pause just briefly for this. And we return to Mark Stein, who has done us the honor of uh, being guest on the very first of our new series of podcasts. Podcasts which you get to simply by going to miltrosenberg.com. Uh, and Mark, I quoted to you an old, a mutual friend of sorts, um, <laughs> Barack Obama. You know, I discovered <coughs> at the uh, radio uh, setup. I discovered a tape I did with Barack Obama when he was running for the state senate in Illinois, and I just had his new book published. And uh, we put it up as a podcast. We found it only uh, years and years and years and years after it was originally done. But it elicited a considerable response, of course, from our audience and from me. As I listened to it, I thought him um, amiably uh, evasive, amiably right. uh, uh, non pin downable. And this was when his ambition ran no further. Like it maybe it did, of course, run considerably further. But his, his ambition was focused at the moment on getting into the state senate of Illinois. 
Well, we've just heard his comment. Here's another one. I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. Now, you're making really negative stereotypes and asserting them when you settle down for the thought that inevitably this is a terrorist attack uh, out there in Benghazi, rather than a sort of a legitimate response to uh, an anti-Islamic insulting uh, video that was circulating rather <laughs> widely. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to go back to that first uh, quotation of of, uh, of the president's yeah. melt, I don't know whether that was from his Cairo speech, but I think it's actually delusional. I think it's actually delusional. If you look at all the hot spots uh, anywhere around the planet, uh, these these are what uh, Samuel Huntingdon used to call Islam's bloody borders. In mm -hmm. other words, where Islam bumps up against something else. And it doesn't really matter what the something else is. It can be uh, Hindus in Kashmir. It can be Jews in uh, Palestine and Israel. It can be Christians in Nigeria. It can be Buddhists in southern Thailand. It can be Australian backpackers in Bali. Uh, it can be Russian school children uh, in the Caucasus. But, but basically, where Islam bumps up against the other, the other, uh, when it, once it finds itself on the receiving end of Islam, uh, it finds itself in a most uncomfortable situation. And that is the complete opposite of what Obama said when he said he saw them as overlapping and complementary. Uh, that's the real problem. The problem is, is what is complementary with Islam? Because well, as, we, as we see in, as we see in uh, Israel, yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, the Jews aren't. As we see in Kashmir, the Hindus aren't. As we see in uh, Nigeria, the Christians aren't. Uh, so, so the que that would se that seems to me the sort of thing you just pull out of the icebox from the standard, you know, multicultural diversity template. Uh, there's there's no difference between a fire breathing imam with his four child brides and a nice uh, congregational uh, lesbian pastor uh, living with the lesbian mother of her three children in some Connecticut suburb. They're all just people of the book. I think that is just I, I think. That sappy, happy, ludicrous diversity uh, is 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 actually extremely problematic. And and one of the interesting features of the the, the Boston incident, one of the most fascinating elements of that is the is the role of Tamerlan Zarnaev's wife, who uh, is a figure of interest for the FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is a woman who uh, came from a sort of conventional New England. I don't know whether the, her family actually came over on the Mayflower, but they, they, they sound as if they actually could have. They, she, came, she came from one of those uh, small-town Yankee backgrounds, and at some point she tells her parents that she's fallen in love with a Muslim guy and she's converting to Islam, and the, guy, and the girl who is just like a normal American co-ed suddenly starts uh, going around as a covered woman. And, of course, the family uh, immediately decide they're going to be very supportive, which is one of those buzzwords. That's one of those princess fluffy bunny words in American life. The important thing is to be supportive. Uh, it's a secondary matter what you're being supportive of. Uh, so the important thing when your kid comes and tells you something is you be supportive and find out later uh, what, it, what exactly it is that you're being supportive of. And I think, I think we have to start relearning how to be, uh, it's, again it's a bad word now, judgmental. We have to start learning how to be judgmental. Actually to take a Enough, to be genuinely multicultural enough to take an interest in a sufficient interest in people and places that we're capable of distinguishing between. Well, let's and let's shift the focus just a bit. You focus on the Tsarnaya brothers, and earlier, of course, uh, quoting Sam Huntington, who, after all, was specializing in laying out the theory that we are engaged in a great clash of civilizations and points us to Kashmir or to Israel or to what have you. But let me give you a geographic locus of uh, uh, closer proximity. Let's zero in, uh, perhaps using our computers, uh, let's zero in on Dearborn, Michigan, the uh, single most uh, Muslim uh, enclave or uh, si small city in the country. Its population, I think, runs some 80% uh, Middle Eastern uh, Muslim. Um, could one not say that assimilation is doing its wonders and there, just as in uh, the hinterland, if not in London itself, the, the hinterland 
of the UK. Um, Muslims are going into another generation and are becoming essentially Brits, becoming essentially Americans, and the eternal threat of Islam, as Sam Huntington suggested was the case, really begins to fade away. No, I, I think that's actually the opposite of, of what's happening, Milt. I think. I thought you would, and I was really setting you <laughs> up to get you to say that. Well, I, I, I think it's, it's interesting that, that uh, third generation Muslims yeah. are less assimilated uh, in, you mentioned London, certainly less assimilated in London and in Europe and in parts of Canada than first generation. Of yeah, Muslims. in London, first it was third generation Muslims who blew up those buses one day. That, that's, that's right. The London tube bombings were, were committed by uh, Muslims who had been born and bred in, in the United Kingdom. Again, I think that's true of the Sarnayev brothers, for example. They came from a secular background, a sort of ethnic Chechen background from Dagestan. I love no. the way, you know, one of the fascinating things about this is that uh, when people blow you up, you're obliged to take an interest in them. On September the 12th, all of us in the pundit class were suddenly experts on Afghanistan, and we were going around talking about Pushtuns and Uzbeks and all the rest of it as if we had a clue what we were talking about. And immediately after the Boston Marathon, bombing when it turns out these guys are Chechens and uh, but in fact they never really lived in Chechnya uh, and their parents currently live in Dagestan and so then uh, you start uh, talking uh, about Dagestanis as if you know what the hell you're talking about in fact there are no Dagestanis uh, Dagestan has got uh, every ethnic group conceivable except actual Dagestanis it's got all these ones that uh, sound like typing mistakes Well, they are all, they are all driving taxi cabs in New York well, <laughs> there's a, well, it's it's fascinating to me that how you know obscure peripheral Russian sub republics can suddenly uh, whatever's going on there can suddenly loom up and uh, and get you. I mean, but but the, but anyway, I, I I was laughing my head off when I, you hear people talking about Dagestanis on the on the news because there aren't Dagestanis. Dagestan's got Kumiks and uh, Azeri and. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, Lesgians, which which sounds like a typing error, but in fact isn't. They are, you'd like to think they were uh, Lesgians, were these obscure warrior princesses <laughs> in the hills of Dagestan, uh, but in fact uh, it's uh, it's a particular e uh, ethnic group there. But they, but 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 the but, but the point the point here is that. Uh, when they came, when the Sarnayev's parents came uh, to this country, they were more or less conventionally secular post-Soviet uh, uh, citizens of the Caucasus. Their children were raised almost entirely in the West, and they have embraced this uh, pan-Islamic, uh, imperialist, conquering, globalist ideology. And that's very common. If you look at third generation Muslims in the Netherlands, if you look at in Canada, uh, the, a girl who was uh, uh, arrested, her husband was arrested for plotting to behead the, the prime minister. She, her grandfather is the pharmacist of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry Base in Alberta. Uh, he's a conventional first generation immigrant. He's a loyal Canadian who supports the troops and their mission in Afghanistan. His crazy granddaughter... <laughs> Uh, his crazy daughter, rather, names the kid her kid after a uh, a Chechen jihadist, and uh, and wants her husband to sign a prenup, uh, pledging that he'll commit jihad or the wedding is over. And I think what's happening here, what binds the Sarnayevs to this family in Toronto, uh, to the ones uh, in, in the London tube bombings, uh, to similar uh, to similar Muslims uh, in France, the Netherlands, Belgium. Uh, what binds them together is that they no long they have no real connection with wherever they 've come from they have no real connection back to their nominal homeland they 've never lived there they have no memories of it um, at the same time they don 't feel American or Canadian or Dutch or belgian and and they 're given no reason to feel American or Canadian or Dutch or Belgian. The Sarnaevs went to what is famously the most uh, diverse public school, one of the three most diverse public schools in America. It's whatever it's called, Ringen, Cambridge Ringen Latin or whatever it is, uh, where, there are, where there are over 80 different nationalities represented in the classroom. Nobody's teaching those guys about the Constitution and Thomas Jefferson and all the rest of it. You're being taught this, uh, this multiculturalist 
uh, vision of the developed world. And as with the London Tube Bombers and as with the school the Canadian girl was at in Toronto, what, you, what you're left with is a vacuum, a nullity. And in that void, uh, people search for alternative identity. Uh, a modern social scientist uh, who thinks he's very practical but in fact is very limited in his understanding of the social order and the way in which it works would probably rep- repost to you right now and say, yes, what we need is to separate them from some of the background groups which sustain them in their Islamic ferocity and we need instead to give them much more American experience. Indeed, break up the groups and get them deeply involved in interaction with other Americans of various kinds, and the overall outcome will be uh, a quicker assimilation and a more rapid shedding of uh, the illusion of continuity with a past which really was never theirs uh, and which they associate with their parents who were trying to get rid of it all along. Uh, let's, uh, de- let's desegregate, so to speak, uh, the ethnic enclaves, particularly the Islamic ethnic enclaves. Does it, would that make any sense if put forward by an earnest and not terribly brilliant uh, American sociologist? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that would make I mean, I think, for example, you see in Dearborn that, uh, that, that, that that has become very rapidly Muslim in the same way you can find communities that have become very rapidly Hispanic or yeah. whatever. With the, the modern multicultural mind denies... Uh, a basic reality of life, that people want to live among people who are like them. Uh, I, I, you, you, you notice it. I, no, I notice it in, in, uh, in my part of the world, in New Hampshire, uh, when you go to some, if, you, if you're, you, you were at Dartmouth College, you, you know what Hanover, New Hampshire is, uh, is like, Milt. And it always makes me laugh when you see uh, people driving around there with the Celebrate Diversity bumper stickers. These are people who, who want to live in an, in an upscale, white, liberal town. Uh, and they like their little diversity trophies. They like it if there's a, a, a there'll be a, like a Muslim software designer uh, who moves in, uh, or they'll or they'll be uh, a, a professor from Hong Kong or whatever. Not to mention don't... not to mention a president who is quote safely black because he right. isn't all that black. Right, right, and they want, but they don't want, but they they would be terrified if you told them. Uh, that their children had to go to the same high school as, as the broken down uh, Yankee hard scrabble uh, flat uh, natives uh, ten miles up the road they would be they would be absolutely horrified by that. Their diversity is limits it's 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 fascinating to me that um, that, uh, that, that that Joe Klein from Time magazine was sneering at Sarah Palin uh, and uh, her tea party people for for not embracing the joyous, wonderful diversity of America. America. Joe Klein lives in a town that is, I think, 98.1% white, just north of New York City. Now, he could go and live in the Bronx if he wants to, but he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to celebrate the diversity myth where he lives. People, uh, people uh, so in a sense, the, when, when uh, Dearborn, some Muslims moved to Dearborn, and then more Muslims moved to Dearborn, uh, and then eventually if, you, if you're a Muslim and you're looking for somewhere to live in Michigan, you think, oh, Dearborn sounds like my kind of town. That's actually a, a very reasonable thing to do. Likewise, in, in, in Britain, uh, where half the non-United Kingdom-born uh, residents uh, uh, cluster in ever denser uh, ethnic enclaves uh, because that's that's where they feel most comfortable. I mean, I think it goes back. If you look at putting when Sa- Tamerlan Sarnayev put his uh, wife, his American wife, in the burqa, in the hijab, it covered her from head to toe. That is a very interesting way of of, of looking at it. You can't assimilate. When you when you put your women folk in that garb, you're eventually you're you're really saying I do not want them to I do not want them to be fully participating members of the society in which we happen to be in in the zip code in which we happen to find ourselves. Speaking so of I'm the, doing, I'm doing as much as I can to wall them off from that. Yeah. Uh, 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 literally as they walk around the streets. There is always the mystery of individual motivation. Um, I'm regressing to being the psychologist I once was academically. And, you know, with regard to Tamerlan Tsarnaev, remember uh, the the, the name Tamerlan is Tamburlane 
or Tamerlane, uh, right. who was a world conqueror, who was a scourge of the West as he rolled forward, setting the pattern that later was uh, was followed, I think, by G- G- Genghis Khan. Though maybe I got that in right, reverse. Right. I'm not no, sure. No, no, no. That, that's, that's right. That's but right. Uh, I wonder, to be named world conqueror um, may have something to do with your deciding, hell, I'll screw this thing up and shake it up a bit and we'll explode some bombs. Um, the, the mystery of individual outcomes is really eternally persistent and eternally mysterious. Yeah, but I, I think I think there's a basic question. I mean, I, I, I find the reaction to what happened in Boston um, hor- horrifying in a way. Of the, course. The, 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 leaving aside the relatively low death toll, uh, you, you look at people who are being carried away with their legs blown off. That's that's not that's not when we say people have lost a limb. Uh, and, and it makes it, it makes it, it, it makes it doesn't sound like a big deal when you put it like that. But these people are going to be in excruciating pain for the rest of their, uh, for the rest of their lives. These are people who are who will never be able to participate in most kinds of sport uh, for the rest of their lives. Their lives have changed. They will be living with the consequences of what the Sarnev brothers did. Uh, forever, and that's before you talk about uh, the, the the Richard family, uh, the the little boy Martin, who eight year old boy, who's killed, um, the uh, the the sister who lost a leg, the mother who s- suffered severe brain injuries. Now, what did they do to deserve living the diversity dream? In other words, at a certain point. There was no need for the Sarnayev brothers ever to be in the United States of America. No need whatsoever. And at some, and at some point, um, the uh, Western, Western society needs to... Look, I'm, I'm not saying every immigrant to America. I'm an immigrant to America, uh, and I have no desire to blow up any marathons or, all the, or any of the rest of it. But, but I would expect the government that admitted me to this country... Uh, to ask hard-headed questions, I had to I had to demonstrate to the United States government that I would be an economic benefit to this country, and that uh, I, I would not be a public charge upon the citizens of the United States. In other words, when when I applied to enter this country, the the United States turned back and said to me, "Yeah, well, what's in it for us?" And that's the question. That's the question all societies should be asking themselves. It's not worth as 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 exciting and exotic as it may be uh, to have some Chechens and Dagestanis sort of filling out the background, so like you're like a stamp collector who's got one of everything. Uh, the, just filling in missing spaces on the diversity quilt is not justification uh, for asking people to put up with what the people who were blown apart at the Boston Marathon are going to have to be living with for the rest of their lives. Are, are you, in essence, convinced that there is something intrinsically, qualitatively different about Islam as compared to the other, quote, peoples of the book, as compared to the other Western religions, namely Christianity and its hundred varieties and Judaism and its five or six varieties. Is there a qualitative difference? Yeah, I think I think there is. For, I mean, I think Judaism, for, for example, is not universalist. Um, whereas, so, so the idea of a, uh, I mean, people are fascinated by the idea of an international Jewish conspiracy and all the rest of it, and uh, there are times when I wish there was one, or at least that I wish it was rather more effective. But nobody is going to be imposing a global Jewish caliphate. Um, and likewise, I think Christianity, I think the difference between Christianity and Islam uh, is there really at the beginning when you when you compare uh, Jesus's final words uh, to his disciples before he ascended into heaven with Muhammad's final words to his disciples? Uh, Jesus told them to go to the uh, to every corner of the then known world and convert uh, people to Christianity, and and Muhammad. Uh, told them uh, uh, told them to go and forcibly uh, make everyone submit to Islam. And I think that's the difference. If you look at uh, Christianity in the Roman Empire, Christianity started at the bottom, the nobodies, the, the schlubs 
converted to it, the servants. And then eventually it spread all the way up the chain until, you know, the emperor is the last piece of the puzzle, basically. Uh, it's the it's the opposite way round at the height of Islamic power when uh, they uh, they conquered Spain and uh, they were at the gates of Vienna. They would conquer territories, they would run them, uh, and then they would set about, grad once they were in full control, that's when they would set about uh, then forcibly converting uh, the, the populations underneath them. So I think that's a fundamental difference between uh, Islam and Christianity. And I respect Islam enough. I respect Islam enough to to think seriously about its uh, about its nature. It's you can moderate Islam. Islam was moderated by uh, the Soviet Union. It was moderated by the British Raj. It was moderated by the Indonesian dictatorship. None of those are attractive examples. Uh, to, 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 to most Americans. Well, you also get moderation from within, movements within Islam, which are more pacific and really less scary. Surely, uh, in general, Sufism, the Sufi brand of Islam, is of a very different order than, uh, than raving, screaming, killing Shiites. Yeah, I, and I, th I think you can certainly um, look, at, um, look, look at differences uh, that, uh, that were there 20, 30 years ago. I think yeah. Balkan Islam, uh, before the collapse of Yugoslavia, was very, was very different uh, uh, from, the, from the way it is in, say, Pakistan or yeah. Yemen. Then, as then what as in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Bosnia probably to this day. No, no, not to this day. That's the tragedy, is that our, in the rubble of the Civil War, the Saudis and the Iranians spent a ton of money, and you started seeing mosques being yeah. built in and the Saudi And they cultivated style. extremity, I see, yes. Yeah, and they, and they radicalized the population. I was in the Central Asian stands uh, shortly after the collapse of the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union. Had a, had a great time uh, with those populations who had a, had a, had a sort of residual Islamic nature. Uh, but not one that was uh, not 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 that one that dominated every aspect of life. For example, they they had all these exotic local uh, local brews they liked to get high on after a certain point in the day, and and you you were able to get merrily drunk with these uh, fellas in a way that you couldn't now, because again, uh, Saudi and Iranian money went in there and radicalized those those populations in Turkmenistan. The crazy. Uh, well, whatever he was called, Turkmen Bashi, the dictator there who died a few uh, few years ago. He was he was a crazy guy. Uh, he renamed one of the months of the year after his mother, and he banned I think it was ba ballet dancing and and uh, was it melons uh, or no no melons he liked but ballet dancing he thought was un Turkmen. He had basically uh, he he wrote his own religious book and insisted that it be taught alongside the Koran, and you had to learn his religious book in order to take the driver's test in Turkmenistan. Mark. Uh, you know, and, 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 and the point there is that uh, as crazy as that guy was, he actually managed, uh, by, simply by having a strong enough counter-pressure, he pushed back against the radicalization of Islam. We uh, approach the point where we're just about out of time, but uh, to close, Mark, first uh, I want to Thank you so much for joining us on our very first podcast operation in this new format. But then, what uh, what consoling aphorism might you offer, coming really from the heart, uh, from the heart of uh, uh, Mark Stein? Uh, <laughs> well, Sid, I, I will I will start I will start there. The words of Richard Adler and yes. Jerry Ross: uh, "You got to have heart." Uh, uh -huh. I was. Uh, from, from miles and Dan miles and miles of heart. Miles and miles and miles of heart from from the musical Damn Yankees, yeah. uh, where the, where the team a uh, bunch of losers, and uh, and, <laughs> and the guy in one of the all time great musical comedy cues, the manager says, "Listen, this game of baseball is only one half skill. The other half is something else. It's something bigger. You gotta have heart." Yes. And boom. <laughs> They're, uh, they're, they're into the song. And I, I had the great, uh, in, in a slightly faintly surreal uh, moment on television some years ago. I had the opportunity to, uh, to sing that with uh, Liza Minnelli oh, and oh. the great Broadway star <laughs> Gwen Verdon and uh, the ballerina Natalia Makarova and all kinds of uh, strange people. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but at the time after America came out, 
uh, Richard Adler, the uh, the composer of that song, was celebrating a birthday. So I posted on my website uh, this uh, this this little thing of me singing "You Gotta Have Heart." And somebody said to me that uh, a, a lady with uh, with a website called Pundit and Pundet uh, said that's really what After America could have used a CD in the in uh-huh. the back jacket flap. After you get to the air, after it's all doom, gloom, apocalyptic despair, uh, a CD with "You Gotta Have Heart" uh, with Mark singing "You Gotta Have Heart" right at the end of it. And I think I think there's a lot I think there's a lot of truth to that. In in the end, I'm I'm an optimist because it's not all about the it's not all about the numbers. Whether you're talking about the debt, or you're talking about the demography, people, it, human individuals can make a difference. That's the lesson of history. Yes, and you know, in a, uh, in one a way, individual one, change other, changes other people's minds, and then they change more people's minds. Well, and you as can roll this thing back. As regards where we're going and what the future will bring, uh, your reference to heart and how you've got to have it brings. Um, to one's thought for just a moment, Blaise Pascal, who says, uh, le cœur a sa raison que la raison ne connaît pas. Yeah. The heart has its reasons that reason itself does not comprehend. It may well be that one can remain optimistic about the human future and about the future of society, even though you can't explain why. No, and, and, and in a way, that's, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. Pascal's absolutely right, that the heart has its reasons, and we deny that. We live in a, a kind of hyper-rationalist age that thinks that anything, ca- anything and everything can be explained by appeals to reasons, but it's not. In a sense, life is a romance. Wonderful. Um, and, 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 and a great nation and a civilization is a romance uh, in the same way, that it, that it operates, on a, it operates on, a, on a deeper transcendental level than simply talking about uh, debt and uh, spending and all the rest of it. And, and recapturing that romance uh, is actually the game all of us, uh, uh, all of us who talk about these kinds of things are really in. Well, that um, we we must close, and I thank you most sincerely. In fact, obviously, what I should say, because, and I say it because I deeply mean it, uh, my heartfelt thanks to you for joining us today. <laughs> thanks, and, thanks to you, Milton. Con- uh, congratulations on being back on the air. It's great to have you back. Hope to see you soon. Thanks. Good, good. Bye, or good evening, or good morning for now. <laughs>